Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Jen Fulweiler. get an hour where my kids can't ask me for anything. <laughs> yeah, you guys get it now. You thought this looked nerve-wracking. Now I'm gonna have a line of 20 moms backstage volunteering to open for me. <laughs> I've been working out this material in my local comedy clubs and people say, Jen, aren't you worried about hecklers? I say, is that where I'm trying to speak, and someone interrupts me with a bunch of sassy back talk? <laughs> oh, I think I know how to deal with hecklers. I tell these guys at these clubs, at these dive bars, I walk in there and I say, we're gonna make that right there, the naughty corner. <laughs> yeah. Anyone heckles me, you got five minutes and time out, and you don't get out till you say you're sorry. I have six kids. People ask me if I'm going to have another. And on the one hand, a seventh baby would be a lot of work. But on the other hand, my punch card at the hospital is full and I get my seventh one free. <laughs> People bring up the fact that I have so many kids at the weirdest times. I was working out at the gym with a personal trainer and she leans down and says, Jen, you have given birth six times. I want you to bring that strength and that courage that you brought to childbirth to this workout. You can do it. And I said, I get epidurals. <laughs> I don't know what she was imagining my childbirth experiences are like. When my last kid was born, I was scrolling Instagram. I found out the baby arrived because the doctor sent me a DM. <laughs> it is, it's crazy having so many kids. You get asked all these questions. Like people always ask me, Jen, don't you want to try natural childbirth? They never ask you that for any other medical procedure. Like if, so, <laughs> if someone's going like, oh, I've got an impacted tooth and they have to extract it, nobody's like, are you doing it naturally? <laughs> Imagine if people use this as a way to brag, like, I'm having my appendix out this weekend, but no drugs for me. <laughs> I want to breathe through it. <laughs> I want to be awake when it comes out. <laughs> we had six babies and eight years, no twins. I'll take that. I'll take, I earned that. Thank you also for the people who just gasped silently. <laughs> but when we would tell people about baby showers, they'd be like, this is not supposed to be an annual tradition. <laughs> we ran out of stuff for baby registries. For my fifth kid, I registered at Sephora. <laughs> my sixth was at the liquor store. When you have your sixth baby, you don't need another baby walker. You need Johnny Walker. <laughs> One of the things you have to get used to when you have a baby is the way other women will talk to it. So your sister-in-law will lean over to your baby and say, you don't have a hat, do you? You're cold, aren't you? Your mommy forgot your hat because she spends too much time on that phone, doesn't she? So the way you handle that is you turn right back to that baby and you say, we're not gonna listen to Auntie Meg, are we? Why not? Because all her children smoke weed, don't they? 
Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Parenting is so hard. I have had to Google things like how to handle classroom bullying, what to do if your kid's teacher has an anger management issue. Oh. Other than that, homeschooling is going pretty well. <laughs> I know it's a strange choice. I know it's, uh, homeschooling is a different choice, but look, it's, it's simply important to me that my children receive an education that starts after 10 a.m. <laughs> People are like, Jen, you're a homeschooler? My cousin is also a doomsday prepper. <laughs> I try to tell them this is a very modern system of education. It's very sophisticated. They won't listen to me. They're like, no, no, no. I know all about homeschooling. I read the book about it, The, the Flowers in the Attic. <laughs> the nice thing about homeschooling, though, is your class reunion is also your family reunion. <laughs> You can kind of kill two birds with one stone there. Now, my oldest child has actually begun going to Catholic school. The only thing is, it starts really early. <laughs> and there's no bus service. Uh, so that is an early Uber <laughs> for him. <laughs> I have a theory. I have a theory that there are two kinds of babies and toddlers. The first kind are climbers. Climbers. These, you know you have a climber if you've ever thought, I didn't think I would have to install childproof locks on the cabinet above the fridge. <laughs> I didn't have that problem because my kids were the other type. They were screamers. <laughs> oh, these kids, they would scream about anything. They would scream about anything at all. Like, I would just try to enforce some simple rules. Like, for example, screen time limits are very important to me. I will not allow my children to watch more than 15 hours <laughs> of screens a day. Try to set these limits. And, these, and, and they would just scream and scream and scream. And they would scream about crazy stuff. Like, I would run into the room Someone is screaming so loudly, I'd be like, what, 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 who needs a tourniquet? And it would turn out, somebody looked at her cracker. <laughs> when the UPS guy would come to our door, I am positive that on more than one occasion, he walked up to our door, heard all this chaos inside and was like, is this a portal to hell? <laughs> I would call my husband at work during these moments when all six of my children were screaming their heads off. They got silent, dead silent. Five minutes before, it sounded like I was standing on the set of the movie Saw. <laughs> my husband answers the phone and it sounds like I am telephoning him from atop a peaceful hilltop monastery. <laughs> and he'd say, well, that's great, we can chat now. I didn't call you to chat. I called you so you will understand how bad my life is. <laughs> and then I'd get off the phone and keep calling him until I got him on the phone when every single one of those children were screaming. <laughs> and he'd be like, that is awful. And he'd be like, yes, thank you, and hang up. <laughs> I am an introvert, in case you can't tell. If you would like to know what level of introvert I am, my children thought it was normal that when someone knocks at the door, you hide. <laughs> it would be like, go, 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 get away from the window, away from the window. It might be a friend. And then they'd go over to their friends' houses and when the doorbell would ring, they'd be like, should we hide behind the couch or the table? <laughs> well, look, I, there's this misconception. Being an introvert doesn't mean that I don't like being around people. I love being around people, 
the way an astronaut likes going to the moon. It is a wonderful, beautiful, joyful experience that makes life worth living. It just has to be planned with careful, precision timing so that I don't die in a burst of flames. <laughs> You know, I'd love to know, is there anyone here in the house tonight, and make some noise if this is you, who happens to be Catholic? <laughs> I was a lifelong atheist before I became Catholic. And when people hear that I chose to join the Roman Catholic Church, they're like, ugh, why? And that's just the Catholics. <laughs> I used to have all of these stereotypes that Catholics curse and they drink and they're irresponsible with family planning. And now I am those stereotypes. <laughs> And so are you guys, evidently. <laughs> you know, the culture around us sometimes doesn't like Catholicism. You know when they realize they need us? When their houses are haunted. <laughs> Try to imagine an exorcist movie without the Catholic Church. <laughs> They're like, we've been hearing evil voices from the basement. It's a demon. Somebody call a non-denominational worship leader. <laughs> Only a Unitarian can save us now. <laughs> but I love all the great dialogue we have now between Protestants and Evangelicals and Catholics. Like a lot of my Protestant friends are getting in on historical Catholic traditions, and I like to help them. <laughs> I like to share my experiences. You know, like a lot of my Protestant friends are now celebrating Lent. So I tell them, for example, about the time that I gave up cursing for Lent. And I say, the thing with this tradition of giving things up for Lent is that you bring it back in a big way <laughs> on Easter morning. <laughs> and I love it. I love it that so many of my Protestant friends are getting in on these wonderful, rich liturgical traditions. I think it's so great. There is an area of Catholicism that you might want to leave to us Catholics. For example, relics. You guys familiar with this? So a relic is where we as Catholics like to take a piece of clothing or even a piece of a body of a holy man or woman who lived and just keep it around so that we can feel close to them. There is even a church, this is true, there's a church in Italy, this beautiful historic church. And inside it is a very delicate, beautiful glass box and there is a saint's head in it. And it, when you see it in context, it's actually a beautiful thing. The saint lived hundreds of years ago. The church is like a thousand years old. And when you see it in the grand scheme of this ornate cathedral, you realize that it's a beautiful thing. But Protestant friends, leave this one to us. Because <laughs> it's gonna be a little weird if you walk into your local mega church <laughs> called Celebration Station And there's a glass box with a guy's head in it. That's Pastor Cody. He was great. I am here from Texas. Thank you, it's a great nation. <laughs> the only thing about Texas, I love Texas, but the only thing about it is that the natural environment that surrounds us is constantly trying to kill us. <laughs> like my house is full of scorpions. 
No, these, they're not that big, and when you get stung, it's not really that much worse than a wasp sting. And sometimes when people hear that, they're like, well, doesn't sound that bad, and we have roaches. And it's times like this that I turn to the Bible. <laughs> Particularly, Luke chapter 10, where Jesus gives his followers the power to tread upon scorpions. So I'm like, I think what is in my house is worse because Jesus hates them. <laughs> I did not know when we first moved into this house that it was full of scorpions. And we had an exterminator come out as just part of a cursory visit, just spray some chemicals. And I followed this guy around like, oh, uh, is that organic? No, 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 no. Don't spray right there. The children play there. Don't, don't spray too much. And then one night when I was just about to turn out my bedside lamp, I saw a scorpion crawling right toward my bed. The exterminator was back at six o'clock in the morning the next day. And he said, ma'am, would you like to upgrade to our platinum package? I said, I want your Chernobyl package. <laughs> These scorpions will show up in the craziest places. One time I sent a kid to the naughty corner, and she got stung there. It's not funny, but... I'm just saying, I didn't have to discipline that kid for like six weeks. We also have rattlesnakes in our yard. And, the, and a friend of mine was like, Jen, if you see a rattlesnake, don't kill it, rehome it. I was like, that is a great idea. I will, I will rehome it into a belt. <laughs> I sometimes fantasize about moving somewhere else, maybe Chicago. The thing is, I tried to imagine how a realtor would dress up that listing. Like, beautiful family home, fully furnished, rustic charm, great for entomologists. <laughs> I, in general, I like living in the suburbs, though. It, it's nice. I like to drive around in my minivan. And when I do, I listen to hip hop. I love hip hop music. And sometimes people hear that and they say, Jen, have you listened to those lyrics talking about fighting with people, getting vengeance on people, using drugs to cope? And I'm like, you ever met suburban moms? <laughs> Lil Wayne saying things like, you front on me, I step to you. You play this game, it's over for you. And I'm like, was he at Michelle's Bunko Group? <laughs> I do drive a minivan though, and these things have so much room, there's even a special storage compartment for your dead dreams. <laughs> That self-image you have, that maybe I'm still kind of cool. I still got it. You shove that in the temperature-controlled lockbox until you drive a different vehicle. Anything that goes into or comes out of a minivan is instantly uncool. In fact, I thought we could solve this nation's drug problem if us moms would just drive around town holding joints out the window <laughs> in our minivans. Just be like, kids, have you tried this marijuana? It's terrific. I think the transition to becoming a minivan driver is harder for men 
they've always got to tell themselves this story. And what is it they always say? They're like, bro, my minivan is fast. <laughs> no, this thing, we're talking eight cylinders on this baby. And you're like, Carl, our neighborhood is actually called Pleasant Meadow. When are you going to need a fast car? Like if one of the mommies at the preschool drop off challenges you to a drag race. I would like to suggest as a service to the dads of America that we get a minivan in the next Fast and the Furious movie. I mean, they've tried everything else, like might as well give this a shot. I said, okay, this could work. So first of all, these huge center consoles would have room for all of Vin Diesel's guns. It also becomes a much more green franchise to have, instead of all these guys racing around in their gas guzzling race cars, the whole squad could fit in one eight-seater Toyota Sienna. <laughs> the fast and the fuel efficient. <laughs> Just imagine the moment that The Rock turns into his gang and is like, guys, they're after us. We gotta go, 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 go. And then he clicks the button to open the side door and it's like. <laughs> I have a tip for the ladies in the house. You know, sometimes it happens, you will be out somewhere and a man is being a little aggressive about talking to you. He's not taking the hint that you're not interested and he'll just keep going. So I'm going to give you some magic words. Say this to any man and he will lose all interest in you immediately. When that dude is like, hey baby, what are you doing later tonight? You say this, I'm driving my minivan home to homeschool my six kids. <laughs> Poof, all interest gone. That guy will be like, I was going to put this roofie in your drink. But I just want you to have it. We travel a lot as a family, but unfortunately hotel rooms have these limits that they don't allow a large number of people in them. And typically the limit is about six people, but my family has eight people in it. So now when my kids talk to their friends about travel, they're like, which one of your siblings hides in the closet when the manager comes? <laughs> my husband and I could not have more different travel styles. I like to travel when I get to a new place like I'm a local. Settle in, spend many days there to get a feel for the community. I feel like I live there after a point. My husband travels like we are fleeing genocide. <laughs> we arrive under the cover of darkness, spend one night there, go to hit three spots, flee again before anyone can recognize us and we are out of there. And we travel in different groups to keep things from getting too chaotic. And the kids that get in my group act like they have won the lottery. <laughs> because I understand that when you are going on a vacation, the moment you step out of your front door, your entire life savings turns into monopoly money. I'll be at the airport with my group of kids and I'll be like, a $16 cookie? You want just one? <laughs> well, let's all get one. <laughs> get two, get three, it's not real money. My husband will be at the airport with his group of kids and the airport that we go to has all of these iconic Texas restaurants there. So you can smell the carne asada from the famous taco stand. And then right next to that, you smell the brisket that has been marinating all day. And the kids with my husband will turn to him and say, Dad, what are we eating for dinner? And he'll 
pull an old granola bar out of his pocket <laughs> and tell them to share it <laughs> while he complains about airport prices. <laughs> if it were up to me, our entire family of eight would go out to dinner at a restaurant every single night that we were on vacation. My husband will go down to the local grocery store, stock us up on food for us to eat in the hotel room. And it's not even the nice food. He'll get like whatever the local generic brand is. And so we'll be peering out our hotel window. We can see the flashing lights of the festive tourist restaurant across the street. And I look to see my children rinsing off plastic spoons <laughs> to eat their value choice cereal. <laughs> we also couldn't be more different when it comes to packing. When it comes time for me to pack, I don't walk through my house saying, what should I bring? I say, what shouldn't I bring? <laughs> Look, I don't need a suitcase that fits in the overhead compartment. I need options. <laughs> you feel me? My husband does not travel with luggage. <laughs> I, I know you are confused. You're like, well, she means not much luggage. No, no. <laughs> he will put a cell phone charger and a toothbrush in his jacket pocket <laughs> and be like, done packing. <laughs> I'm serious, he's stocked up on all of these clothes that are really durable. He washes them in our hotel bathroom <laughs> and hangs them out to dry like we are mountain people. <laughs> He got this idea from college. His fraternity had this ritual where they would drop the guys off and they would give them only a toothbrush and a change of underwear. For some people, this would be a traumatic memory of hazing. <laughs> For my husband, it was an aha moment. <laughs> he was like, do I even need the change of underwear? <laughs> So the result of all this is that when housekeeping walks into our room, they see clothes hanging out to dry, all of this stuff, evidence that there are way more people stuffed into this room than are supposed to be here. All these crumpled wrappers and boxes from generic brand food. And they're like, are they refugees? <laughs> A friend of mine did an exercise with me the other day, one of these things where you're supposed to answer immediately. You don't think about it so that you get to the core of your innermost response. So she said, Jen, okay, don't think, don't think, Jen. What is something that fills you with joy? Go. And I was like, drinking alone. <laughs> The great thing about my lifestyle is that nobody judges me for it anymore. <laughs> when I was single, I would be like, oh, you know, I just, I had a tough day at work, so when I got home, I had a beer. And people would be like, that's dangerous. <laughs> now, I could be like, after a long day of homeschooling my six kids, I locked myself in the garage, cracked open a bottle of vodka, put a straw in it, and went to town. <laughs> and people would be like, that's self-care. <laughs> B 
People are so inconsistent with their judgments about alcohol. You have a gin and tonic at a restaurant and you're sophisticated. You take that same drink, pour it in a Hello Kitty travel mug, <laughs> take it to the PTA meeting, and suddenly you have a problem. <laughs> Why is it that the places you most need to drink are the exact places you're not supposed to drink? <laughs> if I am at a fancy martini bar downtown, little candlelight for the ambiance, some smooth jazz playing in the background, intelligent adult conversation, I don't need a martini. <laughs> I'm fine with a club soda. You know when I need a martini? <laughs> when I am stuck in a hard plastic chair at the mandatory parent information session <laughs> that's headed into hour two and this whole thing could have been done by email. <laughs> that is when I need a martini. <laughs> I took a break from alcohol last year. I, I did six months totally alcohol free. It's not that I thought that I was an alcoholic. I was an alcohol super fan. <laughs> Getting into stalking territory. See, the problem was that I would drink when I watched shows. At the end of the night, I would turn on a show and, and I would have a drink. But then that association became very clear in my mind. Watch show, drink. Watch show, drink. The problem is, I tend to binge watch shows. <laughs> But, and I kind of knew it was a problem when the, these shows were getting a little hazy for me. Like, I, I got sucked into the weirdest documentary about Little Red Riding Hood um, <laughs> called, what was it? Uh, the Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> the nice thing about that break was that I could take the budget that I had been spending on alcohol, and then I had the room for all this extra stuff, like flowers for the kitchen table, the occasional salon trip, that private jet I'd had my eye on. <laughs> Anyone who knows anything about me knows that I love Instagram. <laughs> Instagram has the power to make you envious of any lifestyle you see portrayed on there. There is no lifestyle so random that I will not be jealous of it if I see it on Instagram. Like, I have ended up following all of the Arab royalty. <laughs> I'm serious, Sheikh Mohammed is very active on the gram. And I have previously never aspired to be part of that scene. But I see them on there and I'm like, oh, I never get to go falcon hunting. <laughs> there are warnings now that the government is using our Instagram for facial recognition so that if you or I ever commit a crime, they can find us through our Instagram. And this is the biggest waste of time I've ever heard of. <laughs> because the only reason that any of us are on that app is so that we can look completely different than we actually look in real life. <laughs> After I get done with my filters and my tuning and my layers, like, People who follow me on Instagram think I am a woodland fairy. <laughs> I could rob a bank with a mask on, give out my Instagram handle as I'm robbing the bank. And when the FBI finally tracked me down, they could hold up the picture that I posted on Instagram this morning and they'd be like, Commander, we cannot find Jen Fulweiler. <laughs> The woman we have here seems to be her very tired aunt. <laughs> have you ever gotten a picture with a friend where they 
look like Quasimodo. <laughs> they are hunched over, their mouth was caught open at the weirdest possible angle. You know, they, they, their hair is a disaster, they look 20 pounds heavier than they really are, but you <laughs> look amazing. <laughs> Fresh faced, felt sleek and you're like oh that's a shame for you <laughs> because i am posting this on facebook twitter instagram snapchat what is my myspace password <laughs> because i just got a new profile pic everywhere no but seriously it, if you do that 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 could really damage your friendships who needs friends when you got 500 likes? <laughs> I, so I am not normally good at housekeeping, even under the best circumstances. And when I say that sometimes, people think, Jen's being modest. I bet she's a fine housekeeper. Well, let me give you this example. When my husband and I first got married, we bought a white couch. <laughs> we didn't know. <laughs> When we finally went to donate it, we called Salvation Army. We scheduled this whole thing. We scheduled a whole 18-wheeler pickup, this whole thing. And so the truck comes rumbling down the street. The guy gets out. Our couch is sitting there waiting for pickup in the garage. He walks down the driveway, stops halfway, and says, come on, man, we got standards. <laughs> Salvation Army would not take my living room couch. <laughs> we live near a Chuck E. Cheese. Thank you, yeah, you guys get it. <laughs> so there was a blogger who recently did this expose. There was a blogger who did an expose where he said that the food at Chuck E. Cheese is not fresh and organic. Now, for the record, Chuck E. Cheese denies this. The corporation, not the mouse himself. No, this is important work because when I go to Chuck E. Cheese, I know I'm there for the cuisine. I mean, when I pull up to that plastic table, I expect a white-gloved maitre d' to come up and be like, pardon me, madame. The chef will wait to serve the amuse-bouche until the robot band is finished with the happy birthday song. <laughs> ah, it'll just be a moment now. I see the gorilla has begun his drum solo. <laughs> this blogger also revealed that some of the practices at Chuck E. Cheese could lead to the spread of germs. He has obviously never been to a Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> because the first thing you think when you walk into that place is, this leads to the spread of germs. <laughs> Chuck E. Cheese is like if the Ebola ward at the hospital had rides. The minute you walk into that place, you're like, I am going to leave here with the plague and a stuffed moose. <laughs> and what's it all for? The tickets. <laughs> Do you remember that when we would get our tickets at Chuck E. Cheese and you never valued anything you owned more than what you bought with your own tickets at the Chuck E. Cheese junk store? <laughs> right, like your mom would be cleaning your room and she'd be like, can we throw away this glow in the dark plastic kazoo? And you'd be like, Woman, <laughs> do you understand what I had to do at the whack-a-mole table <laughs> to earn that kazoo? <laughs> I want to end by bringing you into a time in my life when I, I think the chaos of my life reached its absolute apex. So this was shortly after my sixth child was born. Things were so chaotic. My fifth child, she was the kind of kid where you would end up having to make rules that you never thought you'd have to make. 
Like, no taking off your own diaper and throwing it at people when you're dancing on the table. A friend of mine witnessed some of this. She said, girl, that child is turning you into a saint. And I said, that ain't the direction this is going. <laughs> and there was one day when my life just reached its absolute lowest point. So this toddler, crazy toddler of mine, she got hold of a Sharpie. I walk into the room and I see, I don't see her, but I see the traces of what she's done. It starts on the kitchen chairs, scribbling with Sharpie, goes all the way across this couch, all the way over to the other living room chair, across more walls, and then across the baby's bassinet. And I look inside. <laughs> the baby is in the bassinet and the scribbling goes right across his forehead. <laughs> so I take the Sharpie away from her. She reacts as if I have removed an appendage of her body. I send her to the naughty corner. That's one of those times you kind of wish a scorpion was in there. <laughs> she starts screaming, then all of my other kids start screaming because that, that's what we do in our house. And at this exact moment, I looked over and my eyes fell on this family portrait of our family. And it was this beautiful shot of all six kids and me and my husband. Everyone was smiling at the camera so beautifully. And I only had to Photoshop three heads <laughs> to make that happen. And under it, what these, uh, the kids had made a frame for it in their preschool. And under it, on this frame, was the word family in multicolored letters. But the M and the Y were in these yellow and orange colors. And the way the sun was hitting it, you couldn't see them. <laughs> yeah, you know what family spells without the M and the Y. Fail. And this is the word that is right under this picture of my family. And it was in that moment that I learned a lesson that I have taken away. And it is the reason that I came here to be with you tonight. Well, that indicate my airline status. <laughs> I cannot go back to boarding group five, guys. <laughs> I know that a lot of you are going through difficult things. I see your emails. I see your direct messages. I got an email the other day from someone in this room. It's a couple, they have a special needs kid. They just moved, they're having financial struggles. And they said, Jen, we're just, we feel like we're drowning sometimes. It's a lot. Another woman was in a car accident and she's in pain and will be in pain for a long time as she recovers. And then, some of these are hard. This, this one woman, she's in the room tonight. Her husband just started working from home. <laughs> And you know that we have been through a lot too. If you follow me, you know that my dad passed away recently. So midnight tonight will be the one month anniversary of his passing. The outpouring of support that we have received has been tremendous. I even had a friend who offered to write all of my thank you notes for me. And I was like, you are so kind to imagine that I write thank you notes. <laughs> Girl, I'm not at that level. I'm at the thank you text that is mostly emoji level. But it, this, it was sudden. My father's passing was sudden. I had been texting with him all day. He was in a great mood. He was fine. We'd been texting. The last text he sent that ended our exchange hours before he passed was, knock him dead, girl literally my dad's last words to me. I have screenshotted that, thank you.
I have screenshotted that. I look at it every single day. And the other day, it occurred to me, I looked at the timestamp on it, and I realized I have since found out he was in the ER while he was texting me. He didn't tell me this. It was a, a medical situation that unraveled pretty quickly. He didn't want to worry me, so he didn't tell me that he was in the hospital. But based on what I know now, I think he might have known that the situation was very grave. And I think that the irony of that phrase, knock him dead, might have been intentional. And I'm like, Dad, that is so inappropriate. <laughs> but that is my father's legacy to me, is the ability to find humor in any situation, even if it's a little dark. And that is the gift that I want to leave with you tonight. <laughs> Look, guys, I know you guys have some tough stuff going on but try to find a way to laugh because when you laugh, you have hope. And when you have hope, you remember that some way, somehow, it is all gonna be okay. Thank you, you've been amazing. <laughs> <laughs>